Hey, you are listening to Oh Crap Parenting with me, your host, Jamie Gorlacki. This is a podcast for conscious parents who drop the F-bomb a lot. Welcome. I am so excited. Today I am interviewing Jean-Marie Paynell. She's a master of education and hosts the Art of Parenting podcast and is the founder of Your Parenting Mentor, where she guides expectant parents, caregivers, and parents of young children to prepare their homes and themselves for early childhood. She is a birth doula, a parenting mentor, a Montessori home and school consultant, supporting parents and caregivers to raise the next generation of good-hearted humans confidently. Welcome. Jean-Marie and I go back a long way. What? I forget how we met. Did we do, we did like a summit or something together? We did Did a summit like many years ago when I was doing Be the Best Parent You Can Be uh, summits. And, and I remember I interviewed you then and I think we just hit it off and we've been kind of cheerleading each other ever since. So it's good to be here. Yeah. And I was reminded I was just on your podcast, which was super fun. We just jammed and jammed and jammed. So we'll jam today. Um, why don't, is there anything you want to tell my audience about you that I didn't include in your quick bio? Uh, I'm also the mother of uh, two young adults that uh, I think that's my most proud thing to, to know that uh, I did, you know, I mean, I did the best job I could. I always thought, you know, they'll they'll say, oh, you did it all wrong. But today they are well-adjusted young adults doing their thing. I have one, my daughter is in England and my son right now is traveling through Europe. So it's just nice to know that they're happy doing their thing and And well-adjusted human beings. 27 and 23. Oh, nice. Well, you know, Pascal just turned 18 on June 1st and- Yes, I saw that. Congratulations, you made it. (laughs) I raised a whole human (laughs) and it cracks me up because, you know, you and I have both been in the parenting space for a long time. And with the advent and rise of social media, I just think it's wild how these accounts can get so big and it's, you know, and it's a mom and we can all use a village and we can all use, you know, snippets from, you know, people and things they find helpful. But oftentimes, like even in the potty training space, I will see parents who are like mid potty training one child and totally giving advice. And I don't, for me personally, and I'm not trying to gatekeep anything, but I even said when I was investigating homeschooling years ago for Pascal, I met with people who had teenagers or college students who had homeschooled. Cause I was like, I want to see the finished product. I want exactly. to see the finished product. Yeah. And so yeah. I feel like that it's like, I, I, I want to, not that we have to hold the, the only spots in the space, but like, if you want parenting advice, look for somebody who's done it and done it well. (laughs) And that's the same, you know, that's the same in business. We always say, you know, if you want to have like business advice, look at people who are actually doing it and successful and have, you know, not just the, the, the new kid on the block who, you know, Right. I don't know, went viral or something. So Right. I want yeah. to see my financial advisor's paperwork. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> um, today, I really want to delve into your expertise on two subjects. One is Montessori, because you're a school and home consultant. Um, and I do find that Montessori is being sort of bastardized. I know that it's not, is it not trademarked or something? They, there's schools that can use that name, but they're not true Montessori. Exactly. So contrary to like the Waldorf method, Mm -hmm. uh, Montessori was never copyrighted. Okay. So, you know, Montessori is, is a proper name. It was uh, Dr. Maria Montessori, uh, more than 150 years ago who created this way of understanding human development, right? I, I I don't even want to say a method or it's really, she spent a lot of time observing children, observing babies, observing humans, and just revealed to us what the child needed. And today, a lot of that is being proven by, you know, brain scans and so forth. Um, and so, but the, the method itself was never copyrighted. So, so yes, anybody can basically, you know, said, you know, I'm, I'm a Montessori school. I've read a book. I like this and I'm going to do it. And I've, you know, I've personally, 
uh, gone into schools where some of the, the main principles are not being um, dealt with. And one of them was I went to visit a school when my son was really young and, and I was wanting to change him schools. And one of the things that really surprised me is the teachers were telling the children what work to do. And mm -hmm. one of the main principles is freedom of choice, mm -hmm. right? That we know that children are attracted to, uh, you know, very important work and they know within themselves what they need to, to master. <laughs> and I asked the director, I said, uh, what about the principle of, you know, the freedom of choice? And she said, oh, that doesn't work for us. I'm like, <laughs> Hello. And they were calling themselves a Montessori school. So yeah, yeah. I always say to parents, you know, really, really do your homework on knowing what the principles are. And I'm, you know, we'll gladly share that with you, but really do your homework and go and observe, mm -hmm. really spend some time looking, uh, observing, seeing the children's, you know, level of engagement, of happiness, of how uh, adults are talking to them. And this is true, honestly, for any school, if you're going to put your uh, child in a, you know, in a setting outside the home, spend some time just observing and getting, getting a feeling, getting that gut feeling of whether your child will thrive there or not. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I would love to hear about the principles. I think so many people, again, with the rise of social media, they've really equated Montessori with an aesthetic, like the the wooden toys, the beige, <laughs> and it's, it, a lot of this stuff is expensive. There's a great Instagram account where the woman does like, she's totally immersed in the Montessori way, but shows how you can recreate some of these toys, not toys, but activities with household items rather than the right, you know, $200 right. block set. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. I actually have a, a YouTube channel, uh, the art of parenting where I have a lot of little videos, you know, they're just two minute little videos of just things you can do with what you already have in your home. Oh, that's great. I'll put that in the show that notes. No need, no need to go buy, you know, buy things. And, and so, yes, you know, I think Montessori has gotten this, label of, you know, more about aesthetics. Mm -hmm. And there is some truth to that, uh, because there is this idea that beauty attracts, mm -hmm. that mm -hmm. we need to, you know, have these engaging environments. And I remember, you know, being in the classroom, I really took a lot of pride in, in creating this environment and, and, you know, having nice vases for flowers because there was flower arrangements and so all that, because it's true, beauty attracts and we have fragile things that are going to break yeah. because, you know, the children are, are, are know that that's delicate and it's beautiful. So there is a, you know, there is a tinge of truth to that. And the, the, the whole, you know, beige colors and all that is just because, when a child first, you know, uh, comes to us, everything is brand new. So don't bombard them with, you know, loud cloud colors everywhere and all that, which, you know, some preschool settings are like that. Some nurseries are like that right. and it's just too much. So, you know, there is some truth to that, but that's not all there is basically, right? Sure. It's not about what's on the shelf and how you decorate your home. It, and it, you can it, be, it, it, I think it's a simplicity too, you know, the exactly. rotating of a very few toys in the room. Exactly. And, and exactly. You can certainly have, uh, you can have an aesthetic, you can have beautiful, delicate vases that you got at a thrift store. You know, it doesn't exactly. have to be. <laughs> this oh, expensive, it's all thrift I think it's store. just become like this, like expensive, you know? No, 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 no. It's all thrift store. It's all garage sales. It's all, no, no. It's, it's getting the free stuff you see. <laughs> it's that's, you know, that's how you, you create it. But basically the, the, the main principles is that it is child driven, right? It is this notion that we are all born with this intrinsic need to learn. We're curious. We want to master certain skills. Our children are watching us. They observe us. So what they see us do, they want to do the same thing and they want to master those skills. So we set up an environment where 
those skills are going to be a, uh, available for them to practice and to master. Mm -hmm. And so it's really about following their lead, right? The, the big saying in Montessori is follow the child, but follow the child as their leader, right? We are, right. we are kind of paving the way as well. We're not just, you know, it's not a free for all. Uh, and I think that's also another uh, kind of bad label that Montessori gets. So it's very chill, uh, child driven, as opposed to your more conventional schools, maybe where it's the adult who is deciding what 25 children need to focus on today. When we all know that, you know, you have 25 people in a room, you have very different interests and not everybody's going to want to be doing the same thing. Right. So that's, you know, that's a big one. The other thing, and, and I've kind of mentioned this, is this idea that we talk about the prepared environment. And so we are really being very intentional, very meticulous about creating an environment for the child to fulfill their needs at different developmental stages, mm -hmm. right? A, a home for a newborn is going to look very different than for a three-year-old, for example. And so we're following the child as we also kind of uh, tweak the environment for their needs. Mm -hmm. um, and then the other thing within the school setting, one of the big ones, and I think some of the schools, you know, that call themselves Montessori don't get this one, is this idea of mixed age classrooms. Oh, yes. Very, very important that this is like really big for socialization uh, that, you know, we we basically I, I was in a classroom with two and a half year olds to six year olds. Mm -hmm. So I had them for three years and it's just beautiful to see the progression and the evolution. And then, you know, the older child taking such pride in helping the younger mm -hmm. one because they've mastered a skill and they want to show. So it's really recreating that, that family environment where we have younger and older siblings and we learn from each other. And, um, and it just makes a very, you know, cohesive, beautiful group as opposed to, you know, having a classroom with just three-year-olds. I mean, yeah. you go bonkers and yeah. it's not, and the three-year-old doesn't learn from what it's like to be a four-year-old or a five-year-old, right? And it's right? so the powerful for kids. It's so powerful. Like even when I have clients who are struggling with potty training and have older kids, I'm like, have the older kids, have the older kids help out because they take it so much more seriously from the big kid. Like we're grownups, we're useless. <laughs> We don't know how to play. We, so but, true. But so the true. Kids in my son's preschool, um, he had gone to a very typical daycare and then a typical preschool and I hated it. And he got, he managed to get bit five times in one day. And I was like, I don't know what's going oh. on here, but, and like big bites. And so, um, I took him out and I found the University of Rhode Island has a de child development center and they weren't officially Montessori, but followed these tenants. And I cried when I walked into that classroom and they had scissors and paint and tape, like everything, everything was just out in the open. I was like, how come the kids aren't abusing this? And they were like, they don't know. <laughs> and it no, was mixed ages know. and they the six-year-olds yep. were like, come on in, we'll show you around. And the teachers just kind of just hovered, making sure no fights broke out, you know, if anybody needed assistance, but the, the older kids really took over. And I was like, this is miraculous. They set tablecloths at, at lunchtime and real pitchers of water. And the big kid would help the little kid learn how to pour the water. And, and it was so beautiful to watch. And then watching my own son be like, you know, he hit four and he was like, you got to teach me to tie my shoes. Cause there were tires. And if you were a tire, you could help the other kids tie their shoes. And that was like, mm. man, you were like the CEO. <laughs> and so, like, he was so motivated because he wanted to be the helpful one, you know? And I exactly. think we're lacking, like, kids have become so siloed. And they do, they get self-centered, they get entitled. And when they're actually getting the benefit of helping other kids, it's it's so beautiful. I mean, I cried all the time at this school because I was like, oh my God, yeah. this is so great. Yeah, <laughs> no, it's, it's, it, and it's beautiful to, to, to observe like as their guide. And that's one thing we don't call ourselves teachers. Mm. We're, we're guides. guides. We, we like you know, we set up the environment, we guide them along 
And, and it's just, yeah, it's just so empowering to see that, you know, five and a half year old just show the, the new two and a half year old, you know, where things are, how to do things. And also for me, it was a way to make sure that they had mastered the lesson. For example, mm-hmm. I would say, oh, would you mind showing your friend how to do this and that? And I would observe and it's like, oh my gosh, they, they totally understand the concept and, and it's wonderful. So yeah, it's, so, yeah there's so many it, parallels I feel like to my homeschooling because, you know, same thing is like people would say like, you teach him everything. And I was like, oh, hell no, I'm a facilitator. No, 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 no. <laughs> exactly. I, I exactly. sit down at fourth grade math. No, no, no. I find him the people I find. <laughs> right, right. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Exactly. And so that's a big one. The other one, and I think this you know, Montessori kind of gets a bad rap for this is, oh, it's the school where kids do whatever they want. Mm. And no, it's, it's children. We trust that children know what they need to learn, Mm -hmm. right? Because we have set up the environment with, you know, like you say, the pitcher and the water or the, you know, tying shoes or the language or the sensorial or the mathematics. And to be honest, like the curriculum itself is just way, way, way more advanced than your conventional schools. Mm -hmm. Like a child who is in a Montessori school will leave at six, can enter first grade, knowing how to read and write, knowing all of the math operations, knowing the names of all the countries and the flags and, you know, it's just, and music and it's just amazing. So it's just beyond what we can think of it and often Times people think, you know, children can't know all that, but we'd follow their lead. They're curious. They want to know more. And, you know, depending if you have a a child who's, you know, super intrigued with geography, they're going to learn all those countries, you know, very quickly. Yes. I mean, I, it was hard to keep up with them sometimes, yeah. you know, because they just, they just like, oh, the they're a sponge. Yeah. They're a sponge. And that's the thing. That was one of the big things of, of Dr. Montessori is realizing, you know, what she, and, and her book is the absorbent mind mm-hmm. is that concept of the child's brain is a sponge those first six years And so to really, you know, feed that curiosity and feed the fact that they can learn with so much ease because they're going through these sensitive periods with, which means that they're, they're very in tune to just one aspect of learning, whether it's, whether it's movement, whether it's language, whether it's mathematics. And if you're observing and following their lead, you feed that and they, you know, they, they, they leave there knowing their multiplication tables, like it's nothing, right. As opposed to waiting till later when it's a struggle and it's more of a chore and so forth. It's funny you mentioned multiplication because I took Pascal out of school when he was in the middle of first grade and he had on his own figured out the multiplication tables. Exactly. And I, I remember I I struggled with math and I remember memorizing them, but I remember Mm -hmm. like, I I wasn't, I got, I had to have been 25 before I realized three groups of three equals not like, I just memorized three times three equals nine. Right. And and he, he could figure it out. And I went to his teacher and she said, Oh, we're not there yet. So you can teach him that at home if you want. And I was like, okay, so I think you're telling me to homeschool. <laughs> um, yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 Just effortless. No, yeah. And it's funny because I had a, I remember a little girl who was in my class who left. So she graduated. She went on to first grade to a posh private school, first grade, and her sister was still in the school. So her mother would come to pick up her younger sister. And one day she handed me the phone and she says, you know, uh, her name was Lily wants to talk to you. (laughs) And she said, Miss Jenny. So that, that was my name in the classroom, Miss Jenny, they don't know what division is here. (laughs) Because she had gone through it. She knew all of the mathematical yeah. operations with, because the thing is, is you have to understand that Montessori is taught with very didactic material. It's hands-on, mm-hmm. it's sensorial, and where we have these beautiful golden beads, we, 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 we exchange, you know, we work in a group. So it's, it's fun. It's, it's different. Yeah. And so it just, they absorb it, yeah. right? Yeah. With ease. Yeah. So very different. So going back to, you know, the school is uh, where, where children do whatever they want. 
there's limits and order within the environment, sure. right? So first of all, the fact that we have prepared the environment, there's, you know, like you said, there's scissors, but there's just one pair of scissors. There's not 25 pairs of scissors. Right. We have to wait our turn. We're going to, uh, you know, maybe we haven't had that lesson yet. So we're, we, we can't use them just yet or, or other things. So there's always just one set of activity for a group. Yep. So that's a limit, right? We're not, we're not, it's not this abundance and everybody can do the same thing. Right. No, we have to wait our turn or we have to go to something else or, you know, so that's a limit. And then the environment itself is very orderly. Uh, things are always put back at the same right. place because we know that children at a young age are very, very sensitive to order, mm -hmm. right? To, to the physical order, to routines, how we do things. So that's why we've prepared the environment for it to, to have that, that visual order, which gives them internal order, right? Mm. It's very, an environment that is, that is messy, chaotic, is just overwhelming for the young child's brain. So we really, and that's, you know, that is part of that Montessori aesthetic is it's, it's minimalist, it's simple, uh, things go back to, to their place. So there's that. The other thing, you know, the big one that I mentioned earlier when I went to visit a school is this freedom of choice that, we're not imposing on the child that they have to do certain things, right? There are certain r rules, right? Because there are limits. We don't interrupt our friends who are working. Uh, if we want to observe, we often observe with our hands behind our back. So we're not tempted to touch, <laughs> uh, you know, things like that. But otherwise, as long as you've had a lesson on, on, you know, all the different material, you're free to choose whatever you want to work on. And if you're wanting to just sit and observe, that's okay too, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. It's not, we're not telling them what to do. And I think that's really important. And, you know, it's just beautiful to see an environment that is flowing well and I'll be perfectly honest. Those first few a few weeks are a bit chaotic, you sure. know, being the adult in the classroom. Once they settle in as the adult, you get the opportunity to sit on your stool and observe mm -hmm. this classroom of children just doing their thing. And um and be, and they're doing their thing. I just want to you know, make a precision on this is because they've been given a lesson and then they have the choice to repeat that lesson as many times as they need to, to master the concept. Mm -hmm. So oftentimes a child will come in in the morning and, you know, I would just say, good morning. And, you know, what a beautiful day. What would you like to work on today? And they would go off and choose. And, and that's, that's their prerogative. When I see and I observe that they need the next challenge, that's when I step in and give the next lesson mm -hmm. or do a group lesson or things like that. So they're really choosing from their own needs. And that's, that's super important. Yeah. Um, the, the other thing that I think this is a concept that is not talked much about is that within that first, uh, age group. So, so birth to six. Mm -hmm. So, Montessori had this beautiful concept of called the, the constructive rhythm of life, which mm -hmm. are the four planes of development. Okay. Um, and I have a, a little handout if I, I can share with you afterwards, okay. but it's basically kind of these peaks and valleys mm -hmm. of, uh, how children develop. And so those first six years and they're, they're six, they're, they, you know, zero to three goes up three to six, and then six to nine, nine to 12 until 24, basically. And so the first six years, uh, it is believed, at least in the Montessori um, philosophy, that we need to give children concrete and realistic information. So we tend to stay away from fantasy. Mm -hmm. uh, we really base it in reality. As opposed to maybe like a uh, Waldorf school that is very kind of seeped in fantasies and, and you know, there's fairies Fairy and gnomes, gnomes yeah. and, and that's how they teach concepts. And that's, yeah, and that's, you know, that's beautiful. That's one way. But Montessori is very much into, 
giving concrete information to children because that's what they want. Mm -hmm. They're asking us, what is this? Why does this work like this? What is this? What is this? What is this? And so we have to give them the truth. Mm -hmm. We have to give them, you know, um, the the real names of things. Right. right? And, and it's important to know your proper vocabulary, right? To give the real names of animals and to give the sounds of animals. Like I had language cards of, you know, the sounds different animals make. Uh, And, and so it's reality based. And I think that's something that uh, I see some people, you know, saying they are doing Montessori get a little confused Mm -hmm. uh, there because, you know, then it's all about fairy tales and all of that. So that's, that's another one. um, uh, Does that include Santa and things like that? So that's, that's funny. It's always a good conversation that we have around the holidays. Um, not necessarily. Okay. No, Santa, Santa is a big lie. Yeah. Like it's, it's a made up, it's, you know, it's an adult that made up a story. And if you go back, you know, it's marketing, you sure. know, who, who knows what Santa is, right? So we can say Santa Claus is a story that we like to tell at this time of year, mm-hmm. but never, never would you say, you know, if you're good or you're bad. Oh, yeah, or, yeah, yeah. I you think, know, the I think whole, generally we're over that, at least if you're... Well, I mean, I'm sorry, but the whole, the whole, you know, elf on a shelf, I find that really kind of toxic. You know, it's like, you got this thing watching you and (laughs) I hate it. Just, uh, I'm going to go tell on you. It's just, no, I I don't like that. (laughs) And so that's, that's a, you know, that's a lie. That's playing with a child's mind that is just developing right. when they just want to know the truth. They want to know things. So, so yeah, that's and they're very a great black question. And white at that age. Toddlers are black and very white. much yeah. so. Yeah. And I subscribe to the, you know, most of my work is based off of Kim John Payne, you know, zero to six govern six to 12 mm-hmm. garden and 12 to 18 mm-hmm. guide. And the govern, I feel like falls in that it's like, you know, people, it's not authoritarian, but you're establishing the boundaries, the rules of your house, your environment, how you guys react to each other. And so it is that black and white, you know, parents will come to me and say, you know, like, I'm worried about my relationship with my two-year-old. And I was like, mm, I'm not really sure you have a full relationship yet. Like there's bonding happening there. You're laying the groundwork. Like, I feel like the relationship, of course you have a relationship with them, but you, your two-year-old's not equal in conversation, you know, no, they're equal no. in humanity, but you know, the gardening phase, I said, wait, wait till six to 12. Oh, exactly. that's when this, like, that's gardening. You're, you planted the seeds. Now you get to like, look at it. Yes. Grow, yes. You know? Yes. Yeah. So yes. I think it falls in line. Yeah. Definitely. Definitely. And, and, you know, and, and it's interesting when you say about the, the boundaries and everything to go back to that limit and order to me, it's, is we always say that it's freedom within limits. Mm -hmm. So you are free to do whatever, you know, you want in this environment. If you respect the the limits of it, the rules of it. And I think that's really important in our homes as well, right? A child who has no boundaries is a child who is just completely overwhelmed and, and it's just unfair to put that, you know, pressure on them. Do you remember, I do this, like, do you remember the jungle book? Do you remember the original jungle book? There was, I think it was the snake who got hypnotized. Yes. And he had those Mm -hmm. swirly eyes. That's what kids with no boundaries look like. You can see them on the playground and they are free falling through life. And I do want to, I mean, I want to finish up these developmental uh, peaks and valleys because that's interesting, but you know, I really want to dig into to the, like follow the child because this gentle parenting swing that's happening now in my work, I feel like people have got it reversed. It's like, they control their children's play, they control their children's day, they control their children's interests, but they follow their lead in life. And they let the child run the household. And it's backwards, because I'm like, no, 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 they get freedom, like, freedom of choice with limits, right? Like, we don't let them just go out the front door, we keep them in a fenced in area in the backyard. You can do whatever right. you want in that fenced in area as long as it's safe, right? But- <laughs> right. And that's and that's and that's the beauty of the prepared environment, right? right? You're preparing your home that 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 secure environment for it to 
yes, you want it to be a yes environment because it's a lot less, you know, takes a lot of pressure off of you to always be, you know, watching what they're going to get into. I love that. You want it to be a yes environment. And that's for your... Yeah. And that's for your own good as well, right? Because depending on their age, when they are crawling around your home, there are certain things that you just need to move up and it's just going to, it's just temporary. You're just preparing the environment for this person to be living in their home that you happen to share with them, right? Just like you would prepare, um, the guest room for, you know, an elderly aunt that is coming, who's maybe using a walker, you're going to have to move some furniture around to make it easier, right? So you're preparing the environment for them to have that freedom of movement. And that's another big, big aspect of Montessori is this freedom of movement, meaning that we do not tell a child to sit still (laughs) for uh, however many hours, Don't right? Get it me is, started. <laughs> but it's pure torture. I mean, you and I is. know that it's pure torture yeah. to ask a child to sit still because movement is life. Like we're we're moving from the moment of conception until our last breath, and to 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 try to restrain that is just you know makes them unhappy and and so forth so movement is actually used a lot in the classroom right like i would sit as far away from a shelf where i needed a child to go get something so that there's movement within the activity right um, right right you know we have this beautiful activity where we walk on the line where we're we're working on our equilibrium where you know it's just so, so yes, there's a lot of different, um, different aspects that, that help them develop, you know, the whole child, not, yeah, not only their brain, the, but their movement, their everything. The yes environment too. I just love that because, you know, what is it? I, I think a two-year-old has heard the word no, like something like 400,000 times in two years. And, so, and um, I, I'm thinking of, you know, Instagram does have its, its benefits. And one of the things is you see these kids, you know, raised in a Montessori household and maybe a school, but they now have these kitchens with pumps so they can wash their own dishes. And they, I saw this one little kid, oh my God, it was like two and a half or three had a, a some sort of version of a hot plate that, you know, it was hot, but it wouldn't like really scald him, but he made his own scrambled eggs at his play yep, kitchen. And yep. we're busy buying plastic kitchens with the fake, the, the fake nope. pans and the fake t- um, food. And I'm like, Whoa. And that was like such a yes. And the mom, you know, she, she said this was built over time. She said, I don't have to supervise him anymore, but I did for a long time and help be there to, you know, observe and help. But, um, but what a yes environment. I'm hungry and I can go cook my own eggs when I'm three. (laughs) Exactly. And that's, you know, that's what I do when I go into people's homes is I look at it from the child's perspective. Like Mm -hmm. what can a child already do Mm -hmm. and how can we make those things accessible? Right. Mm -hmm. So there, you know, the hot plate idea, for example, yes, but you're, you might not leave it out all the time, but you'll, you know, that you know, they know that they, they will have access to it. And to be honest, like if you observe in what we call, um, a toddler classroom, so this is kind of the, the new walkers until about, you know, two and a half, Mm -hmm. they're preparing food for themselves and for their friends. And in the, in the, you know, in the casa where I was, uh, we leave food out for it to be prepared. So they prepare snack for the entire uh, classroom. They cook because we have prepared it. Uh, Ironing, for example, that is a beautiful activity, but you prepare the iron ahead of time where you, you know, you make sure the dial doesn't go all the way up. Right. And what a beautiful activity. They love it. Yeah. You know, so things like that where, 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 we're really trusting the child. I think that uh, to me, that is the main thing is that we're trusting the process and we're trusting that the child, if they're given those boundaries and if they're, it's set up properly, they're capable of so, so much more oh, than I just see we such give an them credit for. Uh, you know, like kids, this was the first year ever. Listen, I have 
six families that contacted me that they were going to delay kindergarten because their six-year-old wasn't ready for potty training. And I was like, you missed the mark here. You know what I mean? And I'm neurotypical kids, you know? And I said, um, this idea that they're not capable of these mastering a bodily function when we know they're capable by two, you know, and capable of cooking food for themselves or preparing snacks. You know, I just think we underestimate them. And I keep preaching that, like, we can't sit a kid in front of YouTube kids while we make dinner and then expect them at 12 to prepare their own food. Like you have to lay this groundwork early, you know, and and they want to do it anyway. Like what you watch kids play, they're playing the adult things. So we might exactly as well let them into like a little bit more of the the reality of that. It's so, so, so true. I mean, that's just something that I, you know, it, I do have families that, you know, call me and complain because they can't get anything done because, you know, their child wants to be with them. And I said, well, yes, they do want to be with them. So <laughs> involve them, bring them in, invite them in, give them just a potato to wash, you know, yeah. <laughs> that that's, but that's what they want. They've been observing us. They want to be doing what we're doing. And that's, you know, that's a big aspect of that. The Montessori classroom for the young children is we call it practical life. It's all of these things that they have been watching us do or and watching, you know, people at home doing that they want to be doing for themselves. So, yeah. you know, pouring and you know, washing things and preparing food and polishing shoes and ironing, you know, whatever it is. And so we, we set it up for them to, to master those skills. Yeah. It it reminds me too, when you said you started with, um, you know, the beautiful vases and that they're delicate. And one of the things I've been rallying against is, um, sippy cups, you know, all versions of sippy cups, because I actually have a plastic cup here. I can show. I said, there is no cause and effect when a child can drink and toss their cup around like then you you know there's no perfect age where they're just going to all of a sudden use a cup properly and I was a stickler for using real plates and real glasses and I didn't have any plastic stuff because I was like you can't throw that it will break it's delicate you know and probably one time he shoved it off his uh, the table you know and and it broke and he was horrified and I was like that's what we things break you know and so I feel like there's there's an infantilizing as well with like all the plastic or like the idea, there's no cause and effect. You know, if you can throw a, a plastic plate and it doesn't break, you can continue to yeah, throw it. Yeah. And, and don't get me started on this, <laughs> Jamie, because there are so many things that we have created to facilitate things for the adult, yeah. but that are developmentally inappropriate for our children. Yeah. Such as the sippy cup. Oh my goodness. Their t-shirt are going to be wet while they learn to drink out of a regular cup. Big deal. Like, Velcro. You know, things do you like know that. how hard it is to find <laughs> shoes that don't Velcro to tie? Because yeah. there's a whole generation of kids who's not going to know how to tie shoes. Make it a simple knot yeah. because the Velcro is yeah. easier. You know? Yeah. It's or hard. Or the Crocs. Or the Crocs where they just... <laughs> Yeah. Or the, or the, or the pouches to, to, oh, to, yeah. don't get me started. <laughs> exactly. So let's <laughs> offline. <laughs> oh no. My audience knows I, re- I rail against the pouches all the time. Did you know we're actually yeah. seeing developmental um, problems? Kids are getting, their jaws are getting more narrow because of soft food. They're not chewing enough and the pouches and we have infants now with sleep apnea. Like we're seeing actually actual evolutionary changes in real time that normally would take tens of thousands of years to see. Um, yeah. And so yeah. I'm, I'm, I'm a big one. I'm like, give them a bone to chew yeah. on. <laughs> yeah. 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 Um, so let's, t- can we talk about um, how do we take these concepts and, and parents can do this at home because there's, you may not have a Montessori school near you or you may not be able to afford it. So, but these concepts can play out like what, when you go into somebody's home, sort of what are the first things you look for or some big overarching things that you would help them with? So, so depending on, on, on the age, you know, it's going to, it's going to be a little different, but one of the things that I would have parents kind of consider is what is your child constantly asking you for? Okay. So, you know, I'm thirsty. 
can I have some water? Can I have some water? Can I have some water? You know, and, and I remember doing this consultation with uh, a family who their child was going to go to a Montessori school. I think he was three and they had a nine month old as well. And I don't know, we, we probably were in, interrupted, you know, about 20 times because this child wanted some water and we know children, they'll take a sip and go off and do something else. And then, and I said, well, why don't you put some cups down by the water fountain and he can get his own water? <gasps> oh my goodness. <laughs> like that was like, ah. yeah, yeah, yeah. but it's little, it's, it's little, little things, things that you like just that. Don't think right? about. Sure. So it's, it's, you know, and it's, it's again, like you were saying about, you know, if a child is capable of preparing food, like let's put some child size, good quality, uh, utensils. So not these, you know, play kitchen wooden things that don't work, but like, you know, real, real, real tools that are going to work, uh, so that they can prepare things for themselves. Mm -hmm. Right. Um, There is also for me, you know, when they're young is to consider some of the artwork, some of the family photos to bring them down low Mm -hmm. to their eyesight. Yes. Because, you know, we tend to decorate our homes for our vision. Right. And we're we're not taking them into consideration. So especially, you know, when they're when they're crawling around, like have things down low that they can. Uh, look at family photos, I think are always great for, for language and for our family history and all that. It's wonderful conversation, storytelling. Yep. Um, also, the other thing is, you know, I, I have parents that have trouble with their children, like getting dressed in the morning or things like that. Here, I would really simplify things. Mm-hmm. So, bring down the, the, you know, bring down the rod to put things down low at their level Mm -hmm. and on there only put, you know, two or three outfits. That's it. That you're okay with that. You've already selected pre-selected because you're preparing the environment, right? Right. We're not opening up the, the, the closet and saying, what would you like to wear today? Because you know, they're going to choose the one thing you really don't want them to wear. (laughs) So just don't do that. Right. So again, it's just bringing things down to their level. And, you know, for example, like pre-dressing, it could be a basket with a few socks where the child is just going to practice mm-hmm. putting on and off the socks, putting on and off the socks. They love doing that. Yep. Keeps them busy, keeps them and they're, they're practicing a skill. Yep. Right. So for me in a home, it's about simplicity. It's about observing, really observing your child without any preconceived ideas, without comparing them to the kid on social media or your next door neighbors or whatever, watching your child, what they tend to be interested in, what they tend to gravitate towards, what they're asking you for. And that's how you start preparing that environment that is appropriate to their specific needs. Um, and for, for, you know, new families, I actually encourage them to sit on the floor, look at the, their environment from their child's perspective, crawl around their homes, mm. see it from their child's perspective, and you'll, you'll, you'll see things differently and you'll understand more what their needs are. Yeah. And when you observe and you take that time, I think we think we always have to be like super active with our kids, you know, and we talk too much. And somebody just introduced me to an acronym, WAIT. Why am I talking? (laughs) I think that's a really great question to ask yourself, you know, and it's the same thing, you know, I experienced with homeschooling. People would be like, you know, Uh, like, how do you know? And I said, your ears turn, you hear differently. Once you start homeschooling, you pick up on interest because somebody else isn't leading the show. If your kid's in school, you have to, you spend time doing homework according to what the teacher wants done. But when you're homeschooling, it is that you have the luxury of following the child's interest and, but your ears perk up and you see things you're like, wait, oh, this, oh, your, your antenna goes yep, up. You're yep. like, oh, here's something. And then on the flip side, you know, I remember Pascal was like getting into break dancing and I was like, oh, do you want to take like a hip hop class? And he was like, mom, 
Sometimes I just like things. I don't have to take a class. <laughs> it's like, exactly, right, right, okay. <laughs> exactly, exactly. But that's the beauty is like you follow their lead by the questions they're asking you. Yeah. And that's what you, you know, you, you, you teach on. And just to, to uh, another acronym that I like to share for engaging our children at home and, and maybe sh- wanting to show them a new skill. Uh, and I think, you know, like you, you, you just mentioned, we tend to, talk way too much and, and children will, will, will tune off after, you know, a few words. So I use the acronym show when you want to show something, you slow your hands Mm -hmm. and you omit words. Oh, nice. So basically we are, yeah, because we're, we're, you know, like, like this little gadget thing, you know, Mm -hmm. I'm going to show you, look at this. I I have a ball that can open. Do you want to see how this opens? That's it. Had I talked about it, like, oh, you put your fingers, you unscrew it, you do this, you do that. Like, they've lost interest, right? We want to slow our hands so that Mm. they can really observe and really take in the information so that they can then repeat it. Yeah. And that's it. Yeah. Right? As opposed to us, like... We tend to over explain, over lecture and just, you know, blah, 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 that blah, blah. That came out of when- something. It was, oh my God. I remember going to a friend's house and they had, somebody along the way had told her you should narrate. It helps with language. Now, and this woman, when I tell you, she, I was like, shut up. She was narrating. I'm like, I was like, and now I'm going to take a breath and I'm going to walk over to the stove and I'm going to take out a pan. And I was like, your kid can't be listening to you. This can't help language. If anything, I'd be like, no. I'm never speaking again. No. Yeah. <laughs> They've tuned out. I mean, I like, you know, I like, uh, what is it? Uh, Janet Linsbury talks about, uh, sports casting, like when you're at the playground or things like that, when there's, there's like something going on, mm-hmm. you can say what you see. Right. But that's about it, you know, like, no. And, and yes, giving language is very important, but, but we, we tend to like, this self-importance of just having to, to talk way too much. So yeah. Well, I Slow think hands, it, goes back to that. it goes back to that, that kids are empty vessels that need to be filled, right? Like some people have that idea. Like I need to cram them full. Nope. Whereas I don't, I subscribe to, they, they came into the world, but I just got to be the bumpers on the bowling alley. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. No. And their, their brain are mighty, mighty powerful. Yeah. Especially young ones. And then the, the thing I love too, is that I love, I do love the aesthetic seeing these bedrooms and these houses where there's a three shelf, low shelf, and there's maybe three items on each shelf, beautifully displayed, has its own spot. The book is open, you know? Um, and I really think we're getting mired in, I don't know that it's just consumerism. I've really tracked it down to these open concept homes that are just full of space that parents feel like they have to fill it. And I usually have people, if I'm not going in home, film their space. And I'm like, holy crap, that's a lot of crap. Like we, and you know, they're, they're struggling. They're struggling with their kids, just throwing things, dumping bins out too many books, not able to choose a book at the end of the night. And I think a child, you know, like we love books. We want to raise readers, but when you look in a child's bedroom and it's a whole bookshelf full of books, yeah, they're going to pull them out. They're going to have a hard time at night choosing a book. (laughs) Exactly. Exactly. And we have to remember, you know, the children are brand new on this planet. Yes. Like there, everything is new. So why overwhelm them with, you know, this just, yeah. I mean, I, I have been in homes where, where, you know, I start having a panic attack. So I cannot right. imagine that toddler in there and, you know, and the reason why they're just like bouncing off the wall because there's, you know, there's big imagery on the walls, there's toys everywhere and all that. And it's just, it's just an overstimulation and, and they can't handle it. So, yeah. so definitely, you know, when, when I do, you know, home consultation, it's definitely like, you know, taking it a step down. What I love is, is helping them set up the nursery from the beginning mm. 
and really when I say nursery, I'm talking about a developmentally appropriate environment for the child, not a pretty thing to put on Instagram right. of, you know, look at my beautiful nursery. Right. This is in, in, in Montessori, we actually don't use a crib. Mm -hmm. We use a floor bed, yep. uh, which is basically this concept of creating a, 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 a limit again, it's a, it's a physical limit. It's a mattress on, on the floor or, you know, in a bed frame, there's some beautiful Montessori beds that you can get. But it's, again, it's trusting the child that as they have that freedom of movement, they're, they're going to, you know, slither to the edge of the bed. They're going to feel the difference mm -hmm. and they're going to slither back. Right. And yes, they might roll off, but it is only a mattress on the floor. Right. So they're not falling out of their crib. Right. You know, it's, 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 and, and to me, that again is trusting the process where a child who has a floor bed from the beginning will learn that that is where they go to rest. Mm -hmm. And when they are tired, they will go there. Mm -hmm. And when they're done resting, well, they will just get up and go play with their toys mm -hmm. or come see us. They're not, you know, screaming bloody murder of get me out of this crib or, or whatever. So again, it's really setting up this environment where we're trusting the child and we're really helping them you know, nurture that independence that is a basic human need that we all have is, is to be independent. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I think it's wild. Like I, I often have some sleep experts on here, you know, and there's this new trend of keep them in the crib till past four. And I'm like, but we're expecting autonomy. Like, and so th it comes up a lot in my potty training work. Cause they're like, Oh, they're not self-initiating. They won't take this, you know, they won't take the task on as their own. And I was like, well, the first thing you do is get them out of their, their little cage. And I said, you know, I, I don't mean to sound brutal, but a, a crib is a cage and that's how we use it. It is. It <laughs> you is. Know? And, and I said, and if again, you have to, yeah. the first thing you have to do is have somebody help you get out of bed. You can't expect them to act like a big kid in their lives. You're keeping them in a baby situation when, yeah. you know, they've moved on. Yeah. And, and, you know, again, like we were talking about the sippy cup and the, this and the, that it's, these are things that were created to, to appease the adult yeah. because it feels a lot safer to an adult to put a child in a cage, in a container, mm -hmm, you know, mm -hmm. uh, Montessori, Montessori homes are free of containers, right? We don't, we don't have cribs. We don't have exercisers, all of these things mm -hmm. We're we're letting the child develop naturally on their own terms and so forth. Uh, but, but yeah, putting a child in a container, they're dependent on you to read their cues of when they're tired and they're dependent on you to get out of bed. I mean, who wants that? Nobody. <laughs> right. Right. <laughs> well, and I think what we're seeing is, you know, it, these don't sound cataclysmic in and of themselves. But I think what we're starting to see is this downward spiral. I'm seeing very incapable five-year-olds who don't have really any skills, but more importantly, don't have confidence and that self-esteem. And I, parents these days, a, a lot of parents seem to think that just praise is what builds self-esteem. And it's not, it's the, it's doing these no. things for yourself and having autonomy and that freedom of movement and, and trusting, you know, that trust in our kids is so important that it's so, yeah, it's so yeah. under the surface, but it's so, it's so vital. Yeah. And one of the phrases in, in Montessori is help me to do it by myself. Yes. That's what they want from us. Right. So that's why preparing our homes, you know, that yes space and all of that is to help the child know that they can do it on themselves because you know, if, if you think of it, like we're all on, on, let's say on two psychological legs, at least children, you know, we, we stand on, on two legs. First is trust in the world, mm -hmm. right? Trust that we were born in a safe place, a loving place where we're, we're, we're accepted and so forth. And this is, you know, newborn when we're, we're responding to their needs. And then it's, uh, that, that trust in myself, I can do things, Right? right. So if we're if we're taking away all of that and never letting them do things for themselves, well, it's yeah, we yeah. don't we. But then I think, too, what happens is, is I think people think I, I've done podcasts on this before where there's this like magical age where they just 
Well, no, like, no, 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 you can't use scissors. No, 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 you can't use scissors. Oh, you're six years old. How are you not using scissors? And it's like, no, we have to, we have to pave the way too, you know, in exactly. increments. Exactly. And that's that. I, I love that you say that because in, in Montessori, like a lot of the, the sequence is all like these, these exercises that prepare you for later work. Mm -hmm. Right. So I, earlier I mentioned this idea that we do a lot of practical life, right? We, we scrub tables and we wash things and all that. And, and I remember parents were like, well, you know, why are you telling, you know, why are you showing my child how to do housework? Right. It's like, it's a preparation to later work because scrubbing a table, for example, we do it in such a manner that it's preparing the hand to write okay, later. Right. We're going in the sequence of, of writing, right. right? Or all of the, the, the Tape. cubes that we yeah. pick up and everything we're, we're preparing the pencil grip. So it's all these preliminary exercises that are going to prepare the child for, you know, higher academic work sure, later. For sure. Um, we have been talking for an hour, if you can believe it. I know I could talk to you forever, <laughs> but we had, when I did your podcast, I mentioned having a series. I'd love to have you back on. I would love to talk about positive okay. discipline. I would love to talk about your doula work. Um, but this has been wonderful. Thank you so much. Oh, it was a pleasure. And, Thank um, you. Just remind people where they can find you social podcasts, all the things. So the podcast is The Art of Parenting, uh, found wherever you listen your, to your podcast. My website is Your Parenting Mentor, where you can find some downloads. You know, I have some activities, Montessori Nursery, all of that. Um, and that's it. Your Instagram is Your Parenting Mentor as well. Um, but I'm trying to pull away from social media. So. Oh, it's brutal, isn't it? It's brutal. It's and brutal. your YouTube is uh, The Art of Parenting too, right? The, my, my YouTube is The Art of Parenting, okay. yes. And there you can find lots of different ideas for little activities to do at home. And, and I'm going to start uploading my podcast there as well. So. Perfect. Awesome. Yeah. Well, yes. thank you well, Thank again. you, Jamie. All right. Uh, take care, you guys. Thank as you. always, have a beautiful day and rock on. Okay, bye everyone. Just a reminder, if you need additional resources, I have Oh Crap Potty Training. I have Oh Crap, I Have a Toddler. Those books are available everywhere you want to find a book. <laughs> you can also go to my website, jamieglowacki.com, where you can book private sessions with me, buy any of my courses. Those are really geared towards potty training help. And also I'm on Instagram. I'm not on Facebook anymore and I'm not on Twitter. I'm on Instagram, jamie.glowacki, and I do a lot of lives and uh, usually posting a lot of good information. So those are extra resources for you. And as always, rock on. Have an awesome day.